Life is a mystery. Everyone must stand alone. I hear you call my name, and it feels like home. When you call my name, it's like a little prayer. I'm down on my knees. I want to take you there. In the midnight hour, I can feel your power. Just like a prayer, you know I'll take you there. It's like a dream. No end and no beginning. You're here with me. It's like a dream. Let the choir sing when you call my name. It's like a little prayer. I'm down on my knees. I want to take you there. In the midnight hour, I can feel your power just like a prayer. You know I'll take you there. Take you there. <laughs> ooh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Marna Schwartz here, Intimacy Coach. So, so excited and delighted to be here with you today. We're talking about, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Three steps to reconciling faith and pleasure. And I thought this was really important because there's a lot of women in my uh, group. We have a, a free Facebook group called Erotic Empowerment for Women. Uh, and I work with clients and I talk to people. And just across the board, it seems like a lot of folks are like, yeah, I've got some hangups and I've got some shame and I've got some stuff that is help is uh keeping me separate from really enjoying my 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 body my sensuality my partner my relationship and um and it's just it's like the cords the the wires got crossed somewhere and i just find this so drastically sad and frustrating and what's great is you know what my clients work with me and we get to to work on it together and transform it from from what it was into something new where they feel empowered about it but i really wanted to uh bring somebody in who can speak to it from multiple wonderful interesting um perspectives and uh and that person is my dear friend uh beth alia para and beth is just a fantastic woman who, um, gosh, she has, she just, just every time I talk to her, I feel like she teaches me something I, and I've learned something new. Um, and um, how do I describe it? She's wise. She is um, eloquent. Um, she's beautiful and she's super, super kind. So that's the kind of energy that I wanted to bring here uh, with you to, to help me uh, talk about this and unpack this a little bit more. And let me share a little bit with you about her bio. Um, she earned her BA from Santa Clara University in 1996 in religious studies and a master's in divinity from Virginia Theological Seminary in 2001. Beth has been uh, an, an ordained Episcopal priest from 2001 to 2017. That's a really long time to be a priest and has since converted to Judaism. Her wonderful hubby of 14 years is Hindu and together they are raising two beautiful young daughters. Um, so excited that she's here. Welcome, Beth Alia Parab. Hello. Hi. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you for inviting me, Marna. Oh, you're so, so welcome. I'm delighted that you're here. And I'm just really excited for what's going to unfold in this conversation. You know, we've talked about it. Um, and and um, I, I, I just have this experience like wow what we're speaking to speaks to the hearts of so many and i think it's going to help um cause a new possibility for for yumminess in the world so yay, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um so 
so part of the reason I think you and I were both so uh, excited and adamant to talk about this and unpack it a little bit is we've both seen the impact of what can happen when um, when this when this kind of goes wrong, right? When when religion uh, causes something in people that uh, makes them feel separate from from themselves in a way, mm-hmm. you know, the, some mm-hmm. of the women in my Facebook group saying things like, um, you know, growing up in a Catholic home, I was deeply embarrassed by the feeling that would come over me uh, and the, the desire to have sex, but being told it was a sin and bad to touch yourself. So needless to say, there was a huge conflict in me trying to be a good Catholic girl and the desire to feel that extremely yummy pleasure. Another woman says, I grew up in a very fundamental religious home. Sex was surrounded by shame. I remember my mother walking in while I was masturbating when I was about 13. She was horrified and made it clear that what I was doing was sinful and hurtful to my future husband. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a catastrophe. (laughs) Yeah. Really, in, yeah. in, in, in people's personal lives when they're wanting to show up and be intimate. Um, what have you seen in terms of, of what this can cause? Well, it, it varies in, um, in experience, I think, from, um, from religion to religion and even from, um, from denomination to denomination. So having been raised uh, Christian Episcopalian. Um, my dad is a retired Episcopal priest. So <laughs> I've, I've lived in, in that culture uh, the majority of my life. Um, I think the, the thing that is shared in common and that is the most damaging is this culture of purity and modesty that is um, forced on women. Um, First of all, it it causes um, us to feel, to bear the responsibility for for men's right behavior. Um, It says, you know, the way I dress is responsible not only for me, but for any man's response to me. Um, The way that I behave if I'm flirtatious or not, or even perceived as being flirtatious. If I am attractive uh, to other people, is um, whether whether I have curves or large breasts or not, or if I'm skinny or plump or you know whatever I am, some things that I can control and some things that I can't, um, somehow all end up being labeled. And the truth is that in that culture of purity and modesty, um, be you Muslim or Jewish or Christian or whatever, um, the, the end result is that there's no good thing to be because it's all on a spectrum between sluttiness and um, prudishness. And neither one is acceptable. And so what we end up being is frustrated and feeling guilty and feeling shameful. And you really can't win. Yeah. Yeah. So, so rather than uh, religion being a celebration of what's possible um, and the, the, the joy, it's actually, it's causing sort of a perpetual state of hell in society, in relationships. I think it is. I think I think that we we somehow um, some part of us. I think I think a lot of women have suspected for most of their lives that there's something wrong with that culture, but because religion, like other um, authorities in our lives. Um, are there and they are respected and we are told to respect them. Um, We spend a lot of our time pushing down and stuffing um, what our natural instincts are because we don't want to be perceived as um, 
as this shameful, bad, um, sinful person. Uh, it, it's horrible. It's, it's really, really horrible. Um, but I think, you know, as children, we just, we don't know how to do anything other um, than really seek the positive reinforcement that we're going to get. And more often than not, I really believe um, the messages that we're getting at home and the messages that we're getting in our faith communities are, are not positive and are not life-giving, unfortunately. Yeah. What do you, what do you um, see or imagine the impact uh, is of stuffing down our natural impulses and, and making it, making up that we are wrong, we are bad, that those impulses we're having are sinful? I think, I think what you're seeing in your, in your group is, um, is exactly, sadly, what um, a lot of women feel. Um, certainly I have felt in my life, it's something that I've, um, struggled to deal with. And I think there's a deep sadness because we have grown up to varying degrees with, um, with the culture of sexuality is bad and simple. Um, the, the net result is that once we achieve whatever we were told is the benchmark for being able to express our sexuality is that we have no idea how to do it. It's like you have to suddenly, suddenly you're told, oh, um, you're married, you can have sex. Great, go enjoy it. And you're like, I've spent so many years uh, stuffing this that I don't know how to flip that switch. And, and because I was told so many things were bad, um, I'm not sure what I can bring out now and what I should still keep hidden. And there, there's just no, there's no way to, to really transition that. Nobody teaches you how to do that. Uh, so for instance, I didn't grow up with, yeah, I grew up with parents of the 60s. So, um, you know, they, they were very open about sex education. Um, so I understood a lot. Um, what I did get though was sex is for marriage. Uh, so by the time I did experience sex for the first time, um, I was in my 20s. And um, not that that's bad, but what I had done was avoided um, encounters when it might have been a really lovely thing um, out of shame. So I think that um, now, now if there are other things like your, like one of your uh, Facebook uh, members said, uh, masturbation is bad. Um, having sexual thoughts is bad. Um, oh my goodness, then, you know, how do we, how do we learn to let those things be okay? And not just okay, but good. Um, I think we're, I think we're stuck. And I think honestly, we're angry that we were denied that sense of being a sexual being is a good thing. And I think we're grieving lost time and lost joy. That's really powerful. Yeah. I, uh, I think you're right. That is, that is the sense that I get from a lot of people who, who, who go through this. Um, and it's not just, you know, women, lots of people have been impacted by this, Absolutely. um, mm -hmm. uh, rule, right. This dogma. Absolutely. Of, you know, sex is yes. bad, desire is bad, masturbation is bad. And I, I can't help but wonder how it, it may uh, be impacting well-being, right? If if yes. if people believe, oh, my breasts are bad or, oh, my, my pussy is bad and feeling desire is bad and, um, you know, I'm, I must not um, accidentally evoke someone else's desire. I should really right. hide myself and cloister and 
um, certainly not feel turned on. Like, mm -hmm. what is that doing to people's well-being? I, I think that it's make it's it makes us less connected with our bodies. Mm -hmm. I think that we end up um, less able to feel when we want to. Yeah. Um, less able to give ourselves over to the experience of pleasure. Um, less able to ask for what we want. Um, because we've been told those things are slutty or bad or simple or you know, whatever. Um, all those things. Mm -hmm. All those things. So Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think that we we've essentially been denied a piece of ourselves and it's a really big piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And um, just to, to offer, you know, if there's, if there's anyone out there with questions or who can relate with this experience, feel free to, uh, you know, write them into us uh, if you're watching this live or if you, you know, have questions or, or thoughts later, feel free to, you know, get in touch. And if you want some support around helping move through uh, whatever gnarly mess you feel like you may be in around this, I strongly recommend you reach out to me. I have a small number of phone calls that I try to offer each week um, to people to help them um, recreate their relationship with their pleasure, with their sensuality. Um, it's called a sensuality breakthrough call. If you'd like to claim one, I recommend doing it soon because a lot of people are, are going to see this video, but you go to www.marnishwartz.com forward slash talk. Uh, and, you know, we get on the phone for 45 minutes. We talk about what's going on with you, what's not going on with you, what you'd like to have uh, experience and have going on with you and I'll help you create a mini plan to help you get there and if it looks like any of my programs might be helpful in supporting you getting there we can talk about that but either way we're going to have a lot of fun and you are going to have uh, your eyes opened to what's next and what's possible to help move the needle forward for reclaiming your joy and your embodied um, yumminess. Um, so that's part of what I love to do. So those, so if you miss this uh, live video and this opportunity to connect with us here, don't worry. There, there are more opportunities in the future. Just reach out. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about what the, the gnarly mess can look like. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you'd like to comment what your gnarly mess looks like, I encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, and just know that it's not coming from a place of of shame. We're not shaming anyone for being in a gnarly mess. We've both been in gnarly messes ourselves. Um, and what's wonderful about gnarly messes is there can be a light at the end of the tunnel. There can be major transformation around all of this. And I'm curious, Beth, what have you seen, you know, what's, what's possible? What's on the other side of, of transforming all of this stuff? Um, everything. <laughs> Um, Just everything. One, one of my favorite <laughs> quotes is, um, everything you want is on the other side of fear. And, um, and I think that also, you can replace the word fear with shame. Everything you want is on the other side of shame. And the tricky bit is getting through that, that shame. All of those messages that have, you know, we don't, we're not born with those. And I certainly don't find those messages in, um, in any enlightened progressive form of, of the religions that, that I know and, and am familiar with. Um, I, I believe that um, what we have is this need to work through the shame. And it's just, it's not easy. Um, you know it, I know it. <laughs> um, but I think that there are some, some basic uh, steps that we can take to, to kind of work ourselves through that process. And we named that in our, in our topic for today, um, confronting shame, embracing divine gifts and choosing joy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's never as simple as one, two, three. Um, so, uh, I think, I think the expectation 
that you can have is that um, you're going to work through it in your own time mm-hmm. and that um, it takes courage, mm-hmm. which doesn't mean not being afraid. It means choosing to do it anyway, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> um, because who wins? We do. We win when we choose our well-being and then those around us win because we're choosing our well-being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you seen people transform um, exquisitely from feeling um, trapped in this shame box to feeling like liberated and able to really Absolutely. enjoy themselves, their bodies, their desire, mm-hmm. their partner? Can you Absolutely. share a little bit about, about, you know, what is it like on the other side of that? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I have, I have a friend in particular who, um, has just in the last couple of years really just, uh, you know, brought up in a, in a very fundamentalist home, um, began asking questions several years ago, um, pushing at the constraints of what she had been raised with, um, just um, developing ropes of steel around her backbone that said, you know what? You don't get to tell me what's going to make me happy anymore. You don't get to tell me what to believe. You don't get to tell me um, what's right for me. And so it was, it was a much bigger transformation than just sensuality and discovery. Um, but I know that um, she really has discovered a lot about her own sensuality, about um, who she is, about what makes her happy, about um, how to ask for what she wants. And it's remarkable to watch. It's just really, really fun. Um, you know, but I've also um, worked with, with teenagers um, in the course of my ministry and would have them occasionally come and ask me questions and, you know, kind of, well, this bad (laughs) you know or um so so are my parents gonna like kill me if (laughs) you know or whatever and um and my my reaction um was always along the lines of you know your body belongs to you and it's the same thing I tell my daughters there is no one and nothing that should come between you choosing what is right for you. And that includes, it is most importantly about your body. Um, And I, I just think that's really fundamental, but it's amazing to watch the faces of the face of a young person who's being told that whatever decision they make is right um, if it is something that they have thought through and something they are choosing for themselves. Um, Because very often they've never been told that. That's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. I am. I I'm excited to jump in uh, in a f- in a few moments to what are are the tools right to get yeah. from A to B to Z to A, <laughs> A to B to C to D to all the way yeah A to Z <laughs> and um and all before we get to that um before we dive deeper into that you mentioned it a little bit um I'd love if you would share with us a little bit more about your your background your experiences and what um what are I, what I really want the, the audience to understand is what are the, the one amazing, profound uh, depths of wisdom and gifts that you are bringing to the table today. <laughs> like, uh, like, you're not just some lady talking about this. Like, um, well, you, there, there's a, with us a little level bit of that. experience that we all bring. Yes. Right? yes. And, and, and everybody's story is so profound. Um, mine... Um, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the hardest things for me to, um, 
to try to reconcile growing up was just how um, how open and how um, very freeing my parents' attitude toward uh, sexuality was. That they really, uh, I mean, my sister and I had um, age-appropriate books about um, human sexuality and all the parts with illustrations. Uh, I don't know, it was a pretty popular book in the 70s and 80s called Where Did I Come From? with just hilarious, um, but absolutely accurate um, uh, drawings and, uh, you know, cartoonish kind of drawings. Um, I remember the, uh, the, the sperm had little faces and, you know, looked really goofy while they were racing toward the egg. Um, and, I, and I loved and cherished that my parents uh, really were not, um, skittish or embarrassed at all, at least they didn't show it. Um, in, in talking to us, answering questions, um, being very open about sexuality. Um, now contrast that with the experience that I was getting uh, from my church community, um, which was pretty uh, pretty fundamental. Um, even though the Episcopal Church isn't known for being um, fundamentalist per se, um, the area that I grew up in, um, in Central California, um, and the time at which I was growing up, um, late 70s um, and 80s, the attitude was very much that, um, you know, it was a completely hands-off dating uh, policy. And um, I, I remember going to, <laughs> to um, a youth group weekend event where the, um, where the leaders of the conference told us that um, French kissing was a precursor to intercourse and therefore should be avoided until marriage. And I managed to keep a straight face, but even then knew that um, that was absolutely ridiculous. So, <laughs> you know, this, this was kind of what I was dealing with growing up. Um, but I, as you mentioned before, I got my um, degree in religious studies from Santa Clara and, um, and then went on to seminary and became a priest. Um, and I spent most of those 16 years working with children and youth and um, developing uh, a very strong conviction that uh, children and youth really need more body positivity, um, particularly women. Um, my, my study of other religions uh, has led me to believe that uh, it really doesn't matter a great deal which culture you're coming from. Um, misogyny in the shape of making women responsible for men's behavior is universal. And, um, and so I come at today's um, sharing with all of you from that perspective. Yeah. Um, and, and the, you know, part of that perspective is, is a, a reclamation of, no, I'm sovereign, you're sovereign, I'm responsible for my behavior, you're responsible for your behavior. And that's part of what we've seen, you know, uh, in, in a way with the, the Me Too movement, which yes. has been, uh, you know, a, a kind of a mass, um, unveiling of the the old boys club where it was perfectly okay to do whatever you wanted um and you know and and a woman's place was to play along yes or even um i i would even sort of add add to that marna that that men are um are really raised to be that um that that they are urged to be dominant, to take what they want, um, not to seek consent, um, it makes them more of a man. 
And so I think that, um, that it does a great deal of damage to men too. You know, everything we're talking about today, it doesn't just hurt women, it hurts us primarily, but it does this secondary damage to men because, um, you know, a, a lot of men have no idea that we want something else because we're too afraid to say it. Um, men have, um, a lot of men were raised at, not as an excuse, but as, um, as an explanation. Men were raised to behave a certain way and have never been confronted with the idea that they should stop and think about this. So we're actually having the opportunity to educate the men in our lives and say, you know that thing? Yeah, that's not good. Or, yeah, I don't like that. Or I, I find this is a very helpful um, statement and God love him, I do this with my husband a lot. I say, I trust that your intention here is good, but what you said or did or whatever um, is actually hurtful or is um, demeaning. And let me explain it to you from my perspective. So we become educators of the, of the people we're in relationships with, of our children, of our, of our friends, when we begin to, um, when we begin to sort of break out of this shame that we've been living in that says that we're not allowed to really be our, our whole selves. That's important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big conversation. And part of what I love is, um, you know, the, the, the conversations that are arising, right? There's, there's some wonderful women's work. There's some wonderful men's work. There's some wonderful yes. people work, you mm -hmm. know, there's, there's, um, you know, and, and uh, that, you know, and then there's the whole non-binary community as well. And yes. everyone's starting to uh, claim uh, to, to kind of release the shame and claim their truth in a, a whole new uh, sector that I don't, I don't think that, that something quite as um, exciting as this has happened to the, the, you know, this is uh, the human civilization maybe ever, you know, this is, this mm -hmm. is as big as the wheel for people yeah. to say, actually, this is my experience and I'm going to tell yes. you about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it feels to me like a continuation of a conversation that was begun by our parents, Marna. Mm -hmm. You know, that people who were born in the 40s and 50s and were um, young adults during um, the sexual revolution are, you know, began that conversation. And I feel like we are taking up the mantle in an important way that wasn't addressed as much um, at, at the time um, of Woodstock and of, of all sorts of wonderful things with Gloria Steinem and um, so many important pioneers. But we're getting to the point now where we can um, begin to claim our truth and it's about taking it to another level now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how exciting. <laughs> and, um, and I'm not just, you know, making fun, like, like really how exciting is this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So maybe that's a great segue to uh, start to um, unpack a little bit the, sure. the three steps to reconciling faith and pleasure, because, you know, taking these steps can really help uh, support a person showing up in their whole being, their whole truth and not feel like they're yeah. split or divided. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, it's an empowerment for individuals who choose to take this on. Yeah. And, and understanding that it's a lifelong journey. So these things are um, sort of steps and in between, you know, each step could take a person 
um, a week or could take them a decade. It, it mm -hmm. really is, um, you know, everybody's journey is different. Um, and, and not placing, um, not placing time constraints or expectations on ourselves. We don't need any more guilt. <laughs> we don't need any more shame. So we need to, you know, allow ourselves the time to process each of these individually and understand that, you know, like, like the process of grief, um, every, it, it goes all over the place. It's, it's not um, point A to point B, very mm -hmm. neat and tidy. So yeah, um, and I, that and, being said, <laughs> yes, and and also, you know, I think I think you were pointing to this that it's it's you know non sequential, right? That it's more of a, yes, a constellation absolutely. of ideas and thoughts, and you know, mm -hmm. playing with this one and dancing with this one. You don't need to right. wait until you've mastered the first one to move on to the second, but rather, you know, receive these ideas, let them swim around in your brain, yes. and just see what comes out the other side and your path may right. look very different from someone else's. Um, exactly. But these are ideas that, that Beth and I have found to be, um, to be empowering and that, that may help you on your course. And of course, if you listen to it and you're like, nope, doesn't resonate at all. Cool. Find your, find your truth, find your stuff. Yeah. We're not saying, you know, this is the only way by any stretch right. of the imagination. We yeah. just think this is going to be helpful for some folks. And so we're offering it to you in that, in that, uh, uh, inspiration in that desire. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so the first thing uh, that I think uh, has is sort of initial uh, foundational to this is confronting shame. Uh, we all have it um, to a greater or lesser degree, even if you grew up in a completely secular home, um, society gives us um, a sense of shame around our sexuality uh, from day one. And so I think the first thing is we have to look at what we've been taught. And uh, from a religious perspective, um, I want to say first and foremost that, um, that my training and, um, and my belief uh, comes from the understanding that um, scripture of, of any kind is inspired, but is not, uh, you know, it didn't drop out of the sky and it is not to be taken literally. Um, it is, it has, however, been interpreted and the way that it has been interpreted has been for the purpose of subjugating women and for um, maintaining um, a patristic attitude um, of dominance. And so um, if we feel frustrated, if we feel sad, if we feel angry, we have a right to those feelings. And so I think the first step is to, is to acknowledge that what's underneath the shame is deep grief, is um, perhaps a, a simmering rage, is um, all of those things and maybe some other things, but, but we, we need to take some time to revisit those memories where we were made to feel as though um, our feelings, our desires, um, our bodies were not okay. Um, they were bad. They were causing trouble. They were shameful in any way. Uh, and I think that if we can take the time to go through each of those moments, relive them in our heads, and basically shout a big fat no at whoever was telling us that what we were thinking or doing or just how we were was not okay. 
um, we need to go back and replay those memories um, being able to denounce them and to say this is not okay. So whether it was um, a religious leader, a teacher, a parent, um, a friend, we need to um, give, those, give those moments um, their day in the sun and we need to say no to each and every one of them. Um, because until we can acknowledge those places of, of pain, those places where we were made to feel small, where we were made to feel um, less than, we can't really, we can't grieve. And if you can't grieve, you can't heal. So, um, so I think that's the, the first thing that we need to do. We have to grieve what's lost. If we, if we look back on those moments when we were being told that we were shameful, that what we were thinking or what we were doing or how we were dressed or some aspect of our body was inappropriate. We were, we were being shut out um, from something that uh, we saw as desirable. And because we were denied that, um, we not only missed out on the joy of that thing that we were denied, maybe just feeling secure in our own bodies or enjoying that dress that we picked out that we really liked and then our, our pastor said was inappropriate at church or our teacher said they couldn't wear it to the dance because it was too short or too low cut um, or our parents um, said, well, we, we, can't, um, we can't masturbate or we can't, um, we can't date or we can't French kiss or we can't do these things because somehow they're wrong. Um, it not only steals our joy in that moment, but it steals joy every time we encounter that from then on until we give ourselves permission to say no to that. So I think the, the point of of confronting shame is that we have to be able to grieve first. We have to be able to let ourselves feel sad and we have to let ourselves feel angry for the things that, um, that other people's rules and other people's shaming robbed us of. So that's step number one, Marna. Have I lost you? <laughs> I was so wrapped in what you were saying. I was like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> turning my mic on helps. Um, so thank you for letting me know you couldn't hear me. Um, so one of my <laughs> teachers, Marianne Williamson, says something like, uh, grief is the uh, immune system of the emotional body. Mm. And I really believe that, you know, if we are in a culture or in a, you know, condition of uh, other imposed or self-imposed messaging that says, uh, you know, not to feel, not to, you know, lots of things, there, there's a, there's stuckness, like, and even the anger that we would have felt about it, like, oh, well, that's wrong too, like, and everything just gets cloistered in. And I think that's a recipe for disaster when it comes to wellness and health mm -hmm. is to, to, you know, uh, squish your emotions, right? Yeah. So, so starting to, to unpack it and, um, yeah. you know, confront the, the shame, right? If the shame is what's keeping you in a box, say no, 
and Mm -hmm. let that box open and see what's underneath. And under, under that is the rage and under that is the, the, you know, all the different layers and the sadness. And um, part of my practice has become when, when tears come to me uh, and through me, I let them stay on my face as long as I can stand it. Um, as part of my grief process, because um, I feel like it's a, a form of biofeedback. Mm, right? Those mm-hmm. tears have come from somewhere. They've they've come from like within me, within my soul. They were created with a certain uh, amount of you know neurotransmitters and hormones and all the magic that makes us uh, us. So those tears are a gift to myself. Mm-hmm. And I let them stay on my face and, and honor the process, honor the grief, honor the experience um, as a as a a gift to to fully uh, allow and release, kind of like sex and orgasm, you know, and pleasure. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a gift to allow yes. and fully experience. Um, and and after that, um, you know, allowing and welcoming whatever's there, right? Like Rumi's poem, right? The guest house, it's a welcome, whatever's mm-hmm. there. If it's yes. grief, let it, let it flow through you. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, you know, if, if you find yourself stuck in a place where there's a sadness that doesn't end, always seek help. But yes. I think for most of us, um, there's, there's just an experience of like, oh, that I haven't allowed myself to feel that yet. Mm-hmm. And, and now I'm giving myself that gift. It, it's so much a gift and and like you know it stems from this being denied um, the feelings that we have um, society also tells us that you know sadness is something to be avoided at all costs um, so to see it as gift I think is just exactly right um, it is scary to plumb the depths of, of real deep grief. Um, but that is exactly where the healing can happen. We have to go back and address the things that we sort of swept under the carpet, um, the things we weren't allowed to address perhaps as younger people. And so um, seeing that as a gift is is important and oftentimes it's easier to do in community which is why i'm so excited that you have this um, online community this facebook community because um it's so much easier uh for a lot of us to process things in community it it gives us that space for oh i'm i'm not alone i'm not the only one that feels this i'm not the only one who went through that um our, our human experience, our human condition um, means that, you know, we need, we need community. We need people who we feel connected to and who make us feel safe. And so, for example, if your family is, um, is not one that accepts um, sexuality as gift or even grief as gift, then having an online community like yours, Marna, um, or a group of friends or any other place, um, even, even a therapist, um, a safe space to discuss these things, a place where it's okay to grieve, where it's okay to ask questions, where it's okay to be angry and that people will not try to stifle that is so important. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think I was talking with you or someone recently about like shame cannot survive, um, I forget if it's like the light of consciousness or kindness or, you know, being witnessed or, you know, there's, there's a certain amount, you know, there's shame requires a certain amount of cloistering and darkness. Yes. And so when you open the door and, you know, even amidst the, the fear, right. Unpack the, the, you know, the fear and the shame and the doubt, and you start to unpack it and let this light of awareness in Mm -hmm. and, um, and even like, oh, you know, oh, I, I feel this shame. I feel this sadness. I feel mm-hmm. this. And, and it's like, you know, starting to take apart, um, you know, a, a, a closet that's been smushed together and like overflowed with, with uh, yes. stuff. It turns yes. into a little bit of an archaeological expedition of, of emotions and so yeah. forth. But the alternative is, and this has happened for, for more than one of my clients where, um, they they would try to connect with their partner and and the intense feelings would only come up then ah uh, yeah 
yeah. you know, because they start to let their walls down only then. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like, well, okay, that's, that's um, a lot to now it's possible to navigate it in that moment. But you know, things like yoga can start to open the, the physical body from the, the places where we've got stuck energy and so forth. So whatever you can do to nurture and practice. And also, um, as you're working through stuff, drinking a lot of water, you know, especially when it comes to emotions, especially emotions that involve tears, drinking okay. a lot of water is so important. And you have to all strong. That. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> you have to replenish. <laughs> you have to replenish, right? And and actually, all, many strong emotions involve you know tears, right? There's happiness yes. and you're crying. There's sadness and you're crying. You know, and so right. the replenishing that that water, right? And eating good food. And this is where you know in my work it can come back into the nutrition cycle and so forth. Mm -hmm. All super important as you're moving through and creating a new possibility for yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. So that's the first, that's the first step. <laughs> and, and, so, and just to, to redefine the first step is again to is confronting shame, confronting shame. Beautiful. Yeah. Great. So, What's the second step? Second step is to embrace divine gifts. And, um, and I think number one, is um, whether you would define yourself as a spiritual person only or a religious person or both. Um, even, even I think you can stretch it to an entirely secular person. I think that um, whether you look at our, um, our bodies and our, our, mere, our, our existence um, from a religious perspective or a scientific one or like me, um, both, that um, we were created for sensuality. We were created uh, for uh, to be sexual beings, and um, and and so the um, the theology of many religious traditions that has developed over the centuries that negates that to me is. Um, It's a joke, um, except it's a very cruel joke for all of the damage that it has done to people over the centuries. Um, we were meant to express our sexuality. We were um, created the way that we are um, to, to act on those, to have those desires, to act on them uh, responsibly, to you know, be people who who can truly enjoy um, being in um, in a relationship that it's that expresses intimacy. Um, that being said, I think it's really important um, after we have been able to um, be angry and grieve and 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 say no to uh, the shame that, uh, that we have had hoisted upon us in our lives. Um, the next step is to embrace our truth. And um, our truth is a complicated thing and it's different for everybody. So, um, you know, a lot of religious traditions uh, call anything but cisgendered heterosexuality a sin. Uh, so if your truth is anything but that, um, it's something that needs to be claimed and that um, eventually, if not now, um, should be able to be celebrated because like being sexual beings, we were created um, I believe by a loving God who wants you to be who you are. So if you are non-binary, if you are homosexual, if you are heterosexual, if you are trans, if you're queer, however you identify, that is good. Um, as the old saying goes, because God doesn't make junk. <laughs> so um, there is no there's no, um, there's no easy way around that. Um, I know plenty of people who were raised in uh, fundamentalist traditions who struggled mightily 
to claim that truth about themselves. Um, but that is one. Um, another truth um, about ourselves may be um, deciding that, um, or, or claiming, I guess, that um, the teaching that, uh, that sex should only be for procreation or that sex should always be um, dominated by the man or that sex can only be in the missionary position. Um, these are things that are still taught by the Catholic Church, um, much to my dismay, and, um, and all very damaging. Um, it excludes entirely the possibility of sex for its own sake. And, um, and those things lead us to feeling that um, enjoying sex, if you're not trying to procreate, is a bad thing. So, um, so claiming the truth that we enjoy and deserve to enjoy sex for its own sake is a piece of truth that we may need to claim for ourselves. Um, even claiming, as some uh, women have that I really, really um, applaud, that they have no intention of ever procreating. Um, or women who would love to procreate but, but are unable to have children, um, that somehow that robs them of the sense of being um, appropriately sexual. Um, I've heard all different variances on this theme. And I think that separating um, having sex from um, the need to procreate is really important. So that might be a piece of claiming your truth. Um, I think that whatever uh, truth you may need to, um, to claim for yourself is based on the ability here to be courageous, to be brave, and to have courageous conversations with yourself and with your partner. And that means that you need to be able to say, um, to, to ask yourself, um, if I wasn't afraid of any kind of judgment, from anyone else. If I wasn't afraid of judgment from my partner, judgment from um, the, uh, the religious group that I'm part of, if I wasn't afraid of judgment of society, what, what would my truth be? And, and, and that in itself is very difficult um, because we, we are so averse to um, rocking the boat, to admitting um, these very vulnerable parts of ourselves, even you know, for, for me to claim something about my sexuality to me and say, yeah, that's a little hard, but you know, it's hard because as a child, that was not okay or I was worried that there was something wrong with me or whatever, whatever that is that brings in the shame to be able to say, you know, that, that really is my truth. And I need to be able to claim that. And then to be able to move on second step to being able to have that conversation with your partner and to be able to say, you know, this, this may come as a surprise or you, you didn't know this about me before, but that's because I'm discovering it myself now. This is what I understand to be part of who I am as a sexual being. This is what I need. You use your own words, but um, being able to uh, communicate that is huge because if mm -hmm. we can't um, say what we want um, and, and who we are mm -hmm. really, we can't get what we want. No, no. Um, so I think, again, it doesn't happen all in one fell swoop. I think it takes practice, you know, so we start with the small things uh -huh, and uh -huh. we work ourselves up, or maybe you decide just to jump off the deep end, whatever works for you. Yeah. But, 
but it it's generally something that takes time and we have to we have to work at it and again having um, a community in which we can um, bounce these things off of mm-hmm. people that feel safe before we dive into having uh, the conversation with a partner um, could make it a lot easier yeah um, but yeah. Uh, but ultimately uh, the healthiest relationships are the ones where we can be most honest yes. um, where we can really be the truest version of ourselves mm-hmm. and uh, and if we find that we can't if we find that that is rejected then um, as sad as that may be, um, maybe that's maybe that's not the place where we belong. As as the woman I was telling you about earlier, who did so much transformation over the last few years, she mm-hmm. discovered that the relationship that she was in was not really um, the most life giving um, and supportive place for her, and that in order to continue growing, she needed to move on from that. And it was extremely painful, but she chose that. Um, that moving on in order to, um, in order to be the best version of herself. And she is now happier than she's ever been in her life. Um, oh, I'm so glad. So. Yeah. I love what you were saying about community and, mm-hmm. um, you know, I see that a lot in the erotic empowerment for women, Facebook group, mm-hmm. um, where women will post be like, I really want this thing. Am I crazy? You know, or someone will post like, we did this thing. It was amazing. And someone else is like, I want that. How did you do that? Um, <laughs> you know, or, or women are like, wow, I really want support with this. And, you know, they uh-huh. schedule a call with me and we do some coaching and we move through the transformation of, uh-huh. of uh, yeah. what wakes up when you give yourself that space to say, hmm, what's really there? Uh-huh. And, um, and so I just want to extend an invitation, anyone, uh, you know, any, uh, women identified um, people who would like to join the erotic empowerment for women Facebook group to have that uh, community support. You know, all you got to do is uh, find the group and click join. I'll approve you. Um, All of the members are approved by me or someone on my team. So we really try to keep it an intentional container um, where, where we're all really wanting the best for one another and lifting each other up. Um, and Beth, I love what you said too about, um, you know, when, when sharing with a partner, you know, saying, couching it in, uh, you may not know this about me, but to be honest, I didn't know about it. My, I didn't know it about myself either. And I kind of found this out recently and I'd like to share it with you because you mm-hmm. matter to me and I'd like to experience sensual yummy fun together. Um, mm-hmm. I just, I love that as a, as a vulnerable uh, context for, yeah. you know, because that way they're not like, well, why didn't you tell me before? Like, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. you know it, 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 life, be, life is a journey. So, you know, we're always learning, but we're not just learning stuff about what's out there. Mm-hmm. You know, it, we are learning about ourselves and, and we're peeling these layers of things that were dumped on us. You know, mm-hmm. we didn't ask for them, but, you know, society and family and, religious um, authorities, people, people lay things on us like burdens. And, you know, um, we, we don't feel like we can say, no, thanks. You can keep that. <laughs> you know, uh, I grew up having um, multiple reconstructive surgeries um, from the time I was uh, four months old for a cleft lip and palate. And, um, it was not until I was in my 20s that it occurred to me that I could say no to a doctor. And when I realized that I could, I cried for at least an hour for all of the time that I had lost and for all of these, the um, anger that I had Um, both at doctors who had not asked for my consent and also at myself for um, not claiming my power sooner. Now we can argue about, you know, well, I I was never taught that I had any power to claim, but, but I was angry that it had never occurred to me that I had agency, that I had a choice. And I think that, um, 
that when it comes to our, our sexuality, we also may find that we have some anger that we, we just never knew that we could say no or that we could say yes, or that we could say, actually this, <laughs> you know, not A or B, but C. Um, and, and claiming, claiming our, um, our ability to choose and to say, you know, I, I'm not embarrassed about sharing this with you. I'm excited because I'm giving you a gift. You know, you should, that I'm sharing this gift with you, um, this, this vulnerable piece of who I am. And I hope that you will treat it as a gift. I love that it brings it back to the the context the context of of um, gift. You know yes. what what shows up is you know tr treating it like like the Rumi poem, um, which I love the the guest house, right? Like yes. the the whatever shows up, welcome them in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, you know, even if they mm -hmm. sweep your house, you know they may be clearing you out for some new delight. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and especially the, the grief piece and the, and the vulnerability piece and the, you know, sharing piece and creating a context of, of um, appreciation together, especially in your partnership. Mm -hmm. Super important. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Not everything that is shared is always, um, is always yummy or light or happy or warm. Sometimes um, it's broken, it's jagged, it's raw. Um, and it may, take, uh, it may take a while to process. But if we, but if we say um, to one another, if we learn to say to one another, thank you for sharing this, um, we will move through this together. Um, we will embrace this together. Uh, then there's there's incredible um, intimacy to be gained, and a, and a deeper level, I think, of joy uh, to be had with one's partner. Because the deeper the level of trust, um, uh, the more pleasure we experience with one another. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so profoundly important to think and talk about these things. So let's do a quick review uh, and, and welcome to anyone who has uh, joined us. Um, we're talking about, oh God, three steps to reconciling faith and pleasure. We've gone over the first two steps already. Beth, would you be so kind as to remind us what they are? Yeah. So the first step is confronting shame. Um, <laughs> from all of the sources that teach us to um, feel bad and um, shrink from our connection to our body, our desires, um, our experiences as sexual beings, um, to say no to those things and to grieve what's been lost. Um, step two is embracing divine gifts and um, that comes from an ability to see that as we are created, we are sexual beings and that that is a gift. It is not a detriment. It's not something to, uh, to hide away. And that uh, we need to sit honestly with what our truth is um, or our truths are uh, about ourselves as sexual beings. And then to have those courageous conversations with ourselves and, um, and with our partner to be able to get to the place of greater intimacy and joy. Mm, I love that so much. And I, I loved how you said, God don't make no junk. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I can't lay claim to that. <laughs> Actually, I had a friend who, who put it even better. Uh, he's uh, a man who's uh, been with his partner for, my gosh, 20 some odd years. Uh, I think, I think actually they're closing in on 30. Um, very dear friends. And, uh, and he says that uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with God's uh, production. And so <laughs> there's God's production line is not malfunctioning. 
when uh, people who are gay or, you know, anywhere on the LBGTQIA spectrum, um, everybody is made exactly as they should have been. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. But that goes, that goes for all of us, however we identify and wherever we are in our journey of sexuality. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Great. What is the third step? So the third step is choosing joy. And um, I think, you know, for those of us that are here, we know that that is not as simple as saying, I choose to be joyful. <laughs> or I choose to be joyful in my sexuality because we know that this is, um, this is a process and it takes time. And some of us are very new to it. So um, when we've gone through those first two steps, um, we come to um, this, this choosing joy. And I think one of the, the most important things to, um, to be able to really embrace, and sometimes we need to um, you know, make it some kind of mantra that we will repeat to ourselves um, as often as we can. I deserve happiness. I deserve joy. I was designed to enjoy sex. I was in, designed to enjoy my body. Um, for those of you that are uh, religious in, it, in any way or spiritual in any way, um, the divine one wants me to be happy and rejoices when I am happy. Um, we're, we're just meant to have that. And so um, consider having a, a mantra that you can use to fight those um, old destructive messages that play in your head when you have um, an experience that reminds you or, or tries to reel you back into that shame mindset. So, you know, if you're experiencing uh, a, a feeling of arousal and you feel shame, snap back at it with, I was designed to be this way. This, this is my body operating appropriately. I am proud that my body knows how to do this. Um, whatever, whatever feels most powerful to you, claim it and use it often. Um, I, I deeply believe, and I know you believe this too, Martin, that spirituality and sexuality, sensuality coexist quite beautifully. Um, despite the um, harmful messages we may have gotten um, as we were growing up, we may still hear in uh, places that we may worship, um, I don't believe that one must reject one for the other. Uh, I think that it is possible to be very spiritual and, um, and very sensual at the same time. Um, that, that requires assessing a lot of things about your truth and about what is safe and supportive for you. Um, primarily, I think finding a community where um, where you believe you are being supported in your journey towards being your most authentic self. Um, so if you are um, spiritually or religiously inclined, make sure that you are in a place where you are, where you're being supported in this journey, because now that you're beginning to question the things that you were taught growing up, um, you're beginning to discover your sexuality in a way that is joyful. You want to know that you're not going to be placing yourself um, in, uh, in situations where people are trying to pull you back um, and prevent you from um, growing and learning and, as we say, choosing joy. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing, it may sound very, very simple, but um, but again, it's part of the practice. Lean in to the joy. Mm. Um, when you experience something, um, I know one of your favorite words, Marta, is yummy. So when you experience something really yummy, lean into it. 
um, you know, uh, if my husband kisses me on my neck, I'm like, oh, do that again. <laughs> because I love that. And it's just something that makes me happy. So instead of just accepting what I'm given, I <laughs> lean into it. Or I may say, hey, baby, come here. I want to be kissed. Mm. You know, um, or I'll come in to, you know, he may be, uh, he, he loves watching golf. So I can come in and I can sit down next to him while, while he's watching golf mm -hmm. and say, um, is it okay to kiss you while you're watching, <laughs> while you're watching golf? You know, I make, I make it a point to ask for his consent mm -hmm. um, because I expect him to ask for mine. Yeah. Um, but I lean into those, to those experiences that, that feel good. Um, and, and our sensuality is about so much more than just what happens in the bedroom. So um, it can be, um, you know, wrapping your arms around your lover when you're uh, making dinner, or it can be um, something that's entirely by yourself, taking a nice warm bubble bath and, and not being afraid to explore your skin and say, wow, you know what? I just feel so good right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's so many ways that we can lean into experience our bodies in a really positive way. And um, at the same time, being able to um, combat those little voices in our heads that say, eh, 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 or ew, or wrong, um, <laughs> you know, and, and saying, no, I was created for this. And this is the right thing for me. And, um, and to just continually do that because eventually those shameful voices get drowned out by the chorus of good. Yeah. Um, so absolutely. that's part of, part of choosing joy. Mm, I love yeah. that. And, and like you said, it's a practice, right? It, it's, is, it's the you know, it can't be done. It can't be changed overnight. You've spent mm -hmm. however many years doing things one way. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there may be people watching who, um, who come to this conversation with one thing mm -hmm. that they really want to change or thinking just from one perspective. But I guarantee that there are so many layers to um, choosing joy for ourselves, mm -hmm. to, um, to letting go of and, and banishing shame um, from our lives that, that it becomes really a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, you, you might work the, these three steps and then need to go back and touch on one. And then you'll find yourself uh, coming back to them um, repeatedly because you open, you open one door, it leads to another and to mm -hmm. another. And so, you know, you have nothing to lose and so much to gain. Because yeah. um, the joy, there's no end to the amount of, of joy and satisfaction that you can be achieving in your life. It just it takes the courage to um, to keep going deeper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about uh, being an intimacy coach and and getting to talk with people and support them around their sensuality is that it's never just their sensuality right? It's, it's kind of the micro of the macro. It's just one place where your yeah. stuff and your, your operating system kind of shows up where we're mm -hmm. often able to see if there's a disconnect between what we're experiencing and what we're wanting to experience. But mm -hmm. the, the limitations and the messages and the shame and the, the not even knowing what our own truth is, yeah. is across the board. You know, okay. I've never talked to someone who's like, well, I don't know what I want in my intimacy, but I, you know, I definitely know what I want in the rest of my life. You know, uh, generally yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it, it comes together, right. Mm -hmm. Or, or they think they have an idea of like maybe what they want in the rest of their life, but, but like on the, you know, day to day, like being connected with what you really, really want is across the board. Right. Yeah. If you if you're if and if mm -hmm. you're having a, a, a blockage, if you're experiencing um, stagnancy or shame or shutdown or um, you know an in, in, inability to connect with your truth, um, mm -hmm. it's just it's just one area where it shows up. So giving yourself the opportunity 
um, to, to explore. And like, you know, we talked about like unpacking the shame and um, mm -hmm. choosing the joy. Um, it's just, it's, I'm so excited for the, the potential for people who might be watching this, like, you know, curious about next steps to, to have more <laughs> of themselves back. Cause it's, because uh, mm -hmm. the transformations are, uh, are, are full spectrum. Yes. Yes, they are. And, and, you know, there are so many communities out there. Um, I mean, yours, yours is there and it's very explicitly for choosing joy in our sexuality. Um, there are so many communities, um, especially, especially now, I think that are cropping up that really are um, supporting women in being who they are without shame. Um, and, and to those I want to say who are in, uh, just because this is, this is, um, where I come from, um, for those who are in religious traditions, um, or communities that, um, that are very shaming towards women, I promise you that there are communities of faith, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, uh, that are women affirming and women empowering. And so one does not have to stay in a shaming community. Um, there are places um, that, will, uh, that will affirm you in this journey towards being your authentic self and claiming your truth. Um, and, there, and there are plenty of, of secular groups as well that will do that. But I just felt the need to say that about the religious aspect since that's um, my area of expertise. And, and I want to say that, you know, there is life after fundamentalism. <laughs> so, and there is faith after fundamentalism. And it, <laughs> and it exists in, in beautiful harmony with all of the things that are true for you and that are waiting to come out. Mm, it's so beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's encouraging for some people to hear, you know, though there's, there's not room for me to have my faith and have, um, yeah. you know, my experience and my joy as well. Um, yeah. you know, in, in, in my spirituality and my connection, when I'm experiencing joy and pleasure and bliss, um, it, it's, it's, it's interwoven. Yes. So when I, when I experience more pleasure, I'm usually, um, thanking God. Yes. <laughs> you know, like, I'm just, you know, I'm like, I'm literally like, and figuratively. <laughs> literally and, figure, and, and verbally, you know, and that, that yes. was part of the reason it was so fun to, to title this, uh, conversation. <laughs> oh yes. God, you know, because that, that is, you know, in the, in the throes of intimacy and passion and, and yumminess and, and connection with ourselves or with our partner or whatever, you know, that comes up a lot and it's not an accident, yes. right? That that's right. what's coming out of our mouth. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm literally like, like, it, like, I'm like, wow, this feels so good, you know? And if I notice yes. that, that shame speak of just like, oh, I shouldn't feel this good. I'm like, oh, I should feel this good, you know? That's right. That's it's, right. I mean, I'm made to live to, into, um, to live into what we were, um, to what we were created as, as, as sexual beings, um, one of the ways that we uh, offer God praise is to, uh, is to thank God by um, enjoying the gifts that we've been given. And so um, I, can't, I can't think of a, of a better way than to be in a truly life-giving um, relationship where we are um, giving each other joy that, that to me is, uh, makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a, it's a, it feels like a prayer in the moment of mm. like, I'm, I'm, I'm fulfilling the possibility of my design for pleasure. Mm -hmm. And yeah. thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. That which is all for, for, uh, uh, uh creating and allowing it to be so. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so there's this way of it bringing, uh, you know, faith and pleasure closer together rather than farther apart. Mm -hmm. I love that. So just to review and recap, will you go through the three steps one more time, Beth? Sure. 
So step one is confronting shame mm -hmm. um, to address the harmful messages that we've been taught throughout our lives, um, learning to say no to those things that have been harmful to us and to grieve what's been lost because of it. Um, step two is embracing divine gifts, um, recognizing that we've been uh, designed to be sensual beings, um, to take the time to sit with our truth and to discover how that may be different from what we have been told we ought to be. And, um, and to have those courageous conversations with ourselves and ultimately with our partner for deeper in intimacy. And step three is choosing joy because we know that God wants us to be happy and we want to be happy. And um, that we need to learn how to lean into joy to um, not simply accept what we are given, but to ask for what we want and to ask for more of it when we get it. And, um, and to remember that, um, that what, we, what we give um, in terms of, uh, of sharing and being deeply honest with our partner, um, can lead to deeper and deeper levels of intimacy and satisfaction and pleasure. So awesome, Beth. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your gifts today. I really, um, it, it's been a heart and mind opening conversation for me. And I imagine for a lot of our audience as well, um, those of you who, who joined us live, thank you. Those of you who are joining us uh, in the recording, thank you. Um, I hope that it is uh, empowering for you. I, I trust that it, it is and, and has been. Beth, what are you up to in the world and how can people find out more about your adventures? <laughs> well, um, since I am no longer a priest, um, I converted to Judaism about a year ago. Um, about to celebrate my bar, uh, my bat mitzvah in uh, April, and I have opened um, a home bakery called the Hummingbird Bakery, and so I'm really enjoying sharing that gift with my friends and family, and uh, with people in my little community here in uh, in Chicago. And uh, you can find me on Instagram at Hummingbird Bakery if you want to see what. Um, baking things I've been up to. And uh, if anyone has further um, questions for me regarding anything that I've shared in this talk, you can certainly um, address them to Marna and she will put you in touch with me. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Yes. And uh, if anyone is uh, in this conversation for yourself and saying, you know what, there's, there's more that I want. And this, this, uh, this discussion has been a great first step and I'd, I'd like more support. I strongly recommend you take me up on uh, my invitation for a sensuality breakthrough phone call. It's a 45 minute call and we'll talk about what's going on, what you'd like to have going on. Um, we'll create a little mini plan to help you take some steps toward getting there. And if any of my programs are right for you to step into and to receive even more support, we can talk about that. Um, but there's, you know, everything is an invitation. And uh, in, in any case, whatever happens, you will leave that phone call feeling more connected to uh, what I like to call your erotic truth, um, which spans the whole spectrum of of uh, being in touch with what you want in your life, what you want in your sensuality, uh, and what you want in your relationships and intimacy. Um, so excited to, to extend that invitation to you, but I do recommend you take me up on it sooner rather than later. I only have a small number at any given time, and you can do that at www.marnishwartz.com forward slash talk. I'll also put that link in the comments. And speaking of invitations, Beth, I have an, um, I've, I've enjoyed this so much and I have an invitation for you. I'm, I feel sort of inspired by this conversation. It was so rich and so powerful. And we touched a little bit on um, how you connect with your girls about sensuality and sexuality, even though um, they're, you know, young girls at this time, they're going to need to know. And I just find it 
uh-huh. I, I love how you mom. <laughs> Thank you. I love how you mom. And I think that's worthy of a whole um, additional conversation to really explore and talk about, um, you know, the, the principles that you keep in mind t- to do that in a good way. Would you be open uh, to doing that with me sometime in the soon future? I, I would be honored. I would love to do that. Beautiful. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you uh, for tuning in with us today. Um, it's been a joy and a pleasure and a, uh, mm, a an adventure in uh, ideas and liberation and empowerment. I can't think of a better thing to do, actually. It's International Women's Day today. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even think we knew that when we, we planned this uh, and scheduled this conversation, but what a fantastically perfect conversation to have to it's celebrate. Right. Serendipitous. Day. It's totally serendipity. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's, it's uh, God saying, you know, yay, you're on the right track. You're, 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 you know, yes, ladies. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So um, Beth, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, um, you know, I, I, I think the world of you and I uh, esteem you so much and you're such a, such a, a dear uh, connection and friend and part of my heart. And I'm so grateful uh, for you sharing your wisdom with, with the community today. It, it is an absolute pleasure, Marna. And, um, you know, when you came into my life, um, I really needed your wisdom and your um and your life affirming touch and that just um meant the world but it was definitely a serendipity and that's why we're still in each other's lives so i appreciate the invitation to be here today and um look forward to our next topic (laughs) me too all right thank you so much thank you everybody have a great day happy women's day